Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. Hey, it's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Radio. Today's cool fact of the day is that we have an intern program. Well, not really. Our cool fact of the day is coming up. But if you want to spend some time working with people who really, really care about helping others as much as you do, people who care about being just a little bit better every single day, this is probably the coolest internship on the face of the planet. At least I want to make it that way. So if you think you've got what it takes, head on over to the Bulletproof website, look at the career section and apply to be an intern. We're really growing the company and this is a chance to get in while Bulletproof is, uh, is still at its, at its infancy stage. So I'd love to have, uh, to have you apply. Thank you. Today's real cool fact of the day though is that mushrooms are fungi, but you already knew that. But that's not as cool as the fact that they're uniquely different from plants. In fact, they're as different from plants as plants are from animals. In fact, fungi and animals are in the same super kingdom, which is called Opisthoconta, if I said that even remotely right. And if I didn't say that right, given my extensive training in Latin, today's guest is gonna correct me. Because today's guest is a mycologist who's been in the mushroom business for almost 20 years, and probably one of the foremost experts on how to grow your own mushrooms at home and figure out their medicinal benefits. If you've read The Bulletproof Diet, you know that I don't think mushrooms are a great regular food source, but I'm a fan of medicinal use of mushrooms, which is why it's gonna be a lot of fun to talk about the differences between those two things. Uh, the guest name is Jeff Chilton, who wrote the book, The Mushroom Cultivator, which was published, oh, in 1983, and has been an expert in the field ever since. And if you like shiitake, oyster, and enoki mushrooms, uh, he's kind of the guy you should thank because he was one of the guys behind the R&D to make those cultivatable species. Today, he runs a company called Nemex, the North American Medicinal Mushroom Extracts Company, which is the first certified organic mushroom extract company that there is. Jeff, welcome to the show. Hi, hey Dave. Thank you very much for uh, having me. How did you get to be such a mushroom head anyway? Well, you know, uh, when you grow up in the Pacific Northwest, <laughs> we end up with webbed feet here. It rains a lot. So um, not only do we have a lot of water we have to walk through, but it's a perfect environment for mushrooms. So, so really, I had mushrooms around me most of my life growing up. And then, you know, as a child of the 60s, mushrooms sort of came of age with me. So mushrooms are a pretty common food source, and I'm, I've seen the, the, some studies about how, say, white button mushrooms can contribute to smooth cell wall proliferation, one of the markers of cardiac disease. And, and I tend to find that people get yeast problems when they eat a lot of mushrooms. And, and I've basically said, look, steer clear of mushrooms for a while, see how you feel, and then you can add them back in. But they're kind of a, a suspect food where they, because they have so many complex compounds in them, you oftentimes don't know what they're going to do, uh, which is why also they make amazing medicine. Uh, do, you, do you focus more on them medicinally or more from a food perspective? And how's that changed over the course of your career? Well, you know, in the beginning, I um, was a mushroom grower. And so that was the food end of things. And I, I started as a mushroom grower in 1973. I, I got out of university. And, and what do you do when you um, have got a, um, a degree in anthropology. I did study some <laughs> mycolo mycology, and, and I wouldn't call myself actually a mycologist. I, I don't have a degree in mycology, okay. but I did study mycology and uh, anthropology. But after that, I went to uh, work on a mushroom farm because I was really interested in knowing how to grow them. So I grew mushrooms as food for 10 years, and not just the button mushroom that you see in... Uh, all the stores, but shiitake and oyster mushroom and other what we would call specialty mushrooms. So uh, that that's a, a big part of it for me was uh, uh, mushrooms as food. But I also knew that mushrooms had this medicinal side to them. And so that was something that I was always very interested in and something that ultimately I started reading more about. And then that became the, uh, the basis for my business. So now you use extracts of mushrooms rather than whole mushrooms medicinally. Well, you know, you know what, the, and this is this is an important part for all um, herbal medicines, and that is how do we get enough of the active compounds 
from that particular plant or mushroom to, to benefit us. Because, uh, for example, if you just take um, an herb or a mushroom and you grind it up to a powder, you're going to have to really take a lot of that powder. And, and, you know, most companies are putting out products that are uh, capsules of 500 milligrams and they say take two a day. Well, that's one gram of dried powder. And that's really not enough to give you an, an actual medicinal dose. And so, so the key there is how do we concentrate those mushrooms down into to a, a form that will allow you to, to actually get a, a beneficial dose. And, and that's the key because, you know, you and your listeners, when they take something, they want to know that they're actually getting uh, uh, the right amount of it or something that will actually produce an effect. You wrote a white paper, which is the reason I asked you to be on the show. I just came across it. Actually, your son, who's a Bulletproof follower, sent it to me. And he is indeed, yeah. I, I was like, wow, this is really neat. Because you wrote a 30-page paper, and you did a bunch of laboratory analysis, and you That's found right. that a lot of the mushroom products that are on the market are, well, what did you find in this white paper? I don't have to translate it. You, you wrote it. <laughs> what did it say? It was pretty groundbreaking. Well, yeah, and, and, and thank you for mentioning that, because, you know, the, one of the things is I could maybe sit here and talk about other people's research, but this is actually research that we did ourselves, and, and, and that's something that for me has been very, very important right from the very beginning with my company. I wanted to analyze my products for the active compound so that I could say to my customers, look, the product I'm giving you has X amount of the actives. So, so um, I did a study with 100 different samples and the key compound in mushrooms, all mushrooms, the really key medicinal compound are what are called beta-glucans. And, and after many years, there finally was a test where we could measure the beta-glucan content of mushrooms, specifically for mushrooms. So, so what I did is I took 100 samples. I started with dried mushrooms. I, I also had um, mushroom extracts. And then I went out on the marketplace and I bought... 40 different products that were on the market, many of which were what are called mycelium. And, and mycelium, the thing is, mycelium is one part of this fungal organism that we often call a mushroom. But mycelium is the actual body of the organism and the mushroom is the fruiting body. We you normally only see the mushroom because we're out walking around and we see this thing sticking out of the ground and we think, wow, mushroom. But what we don't realize is that under the ground is the actual fungal organism itself that produces the mushroom. The mushroom is the fruiting body and it's there for just a short period of time. So my study essentially analyzed mushrooms, it analyzed the mycelium, and, and came up with actual hard data on these various products. And, and, the, and the important part about it is that I, I took and analyzed a lot of products right off the, uh, the marketplace, products that were out there, just I bought the bottles, we took them out of the capsules, and they became part of this study. And, and what we found was that the vast majority of, the majority of these products that were called mycelium products actually were mostly starch. Well, the reason they were actually um, starch was because um, these mycelium products were being grown on grain and the grain at the end of the process was not being separated from the mushroom mycelium. So what you ended up with was a, a product that was very high in residual grain and very low in mycelium. So, so you're, you're actually could be getting gluten containing mushrooms. Well, well, here, here's the thing. You, the, the grains that most of these producers are using are, is gluten-free. A lot oh, of them are good. using brown rice. Okay. A lot of them are using other grains. So it, it's gluten-free, but the, the problem is, is that these products are being sold as mushrooms. And so when you go out and you look at the label, it says reishi mushroom or shiitake mushroom, uh, when in fact... The product is this fungal mycelium uh, in a very small amount and mostly this residual grain. And, and the reason that we were able to uh, ascertain this was because mushrooms do not contain starch. 
Mushrooms, mushrooms for any sort of storage like that, they contain glycogen, but very small amounts of that. Um, so, so the mushrooms were very high in beta-glucan, the uh, lo next to no starch, the mycelium on grain products were very high in starch and very low in beta-glucan. So it's just the opposite of what a medicinal mushroom product was supposed to be. So, so I'm looking out at the marketplace and I'm going, holy smokes, we have all these products out there that people are buying thinking they're getting medicinal mushrooms and the medicinal compounds in them when in fact they were actually buying mostly grain powder. This is going to cause a major storm in the mushroom industry because mushrooms have become really a hot thing, medicinal mushrooms. And what your data shows is that there's quite a lot of, we'll just say deceptive practice in, in that business. Well, I, and, and what I call these are facsimile products. They're not genuine medicinal mushroom products. And, and you know, for me in this business, I'm trying to sell a therapeutic product. I'm trying to sell a product and people buying them want something that, that is gonna be therapeutic. They're buying it for a reason because because they have, they have read about these things. They, they've um, learned that they're very good for enhancing immunity. They potentiate our, our immunity. That's why people are purchasing these products. But, but in this case, a lot of those products are simply mislabeled and also manufactured in a way that does not produce the medicinal compounds that people are looking for in medicinal mushrooms. Now, you do sell mushrooms that are done right, so you kind of have a vested interest in saying this. You published all the data in your white paper. Did you publish the lab reports? Like, how complete is this? Well, you know, I'll tell you what. Um, I'm, I'm a raw material supplier, so I sell products to companies that then take my raw materials, my mushroom extracts, put it in um, capsules, bottles, put their label on it, and I've been in the business since 1991. And you know, the fact of the matter is, is with this study, personally, whether I sell more product or not makes very little difference to me. Okay. My, my business is pretty stable. Um, I don't have to sell more product. Doesn't really matter. But, but for me, the most important thing is this is a category that I feel is really important. And people deserve to be, yeah. to be taking genuine medicinal mushroom products. At some point, if they're taking products that have none of the medicinal compounds in them, then ultimately they'll say, well, yeah, I've tried these medicinal mushrooms, but you know what? They really didn't do much for me. And, and so that's my feeling about it all. I want, I want this category because I believe in it. I believe these mushrooms can, can help people. These mushrooms have, um, they're proven scientifically to have benefits. And, and so I think people should deserve to be, uh, um, to um, have those benefits when they, when they buy these products. I, I just think, uh, and this is something that, you know, it's, it's all industries have this type of thing going on to some degree. And in this business, there's a lot of products out there, not just mushrooms, but a lot of products that maybe Maybe they're just very low potency products. Maybe they're the, what I call lowest common denominator. I mean, you've probably seen those kind of products in year uh, when you're out there as oh, yeah. well. Products where you go, well, yeah, this is kind of like an entry level. Probably not going to get much out of this. You're probably wasting your money. And whereas a good product is, there are good products out there, and you can find them. And but maybe you'll have to pay a little more or something. And and it's a tough market, Dave. I mean, everybody out there, all the companies I sell to, they're competing. At like 9.95 and 19.95, and so there's so much pressure to to um, purchase the cheapest product out there. Yeah, you also get you also get these companies who will put in you know 750 micrograms of, of substances where I take 50 milligrams a day. So they're putting in less than one milligram so they can have it on the label, even though they know that it's really not physiologically active, but at least you know, it's there to look good. And some of the really expensive guys do that too. Oh, that's absolutely right. And, 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 you know, one of the things that if you look closely at a lot of the studies that are being done and you look at the amounts that are being used uh, to get the kinds of results that they're getting in the studies, well, you'd know that to get those results, a person would have to take 
a, a tremendous amount of these particular products, whether, you know, even with some of the mushroom products. And, and one of those in, in particular, I would say, would be even uh, this uh, Harissia marinaceus, which is a lot of people are interested in now. It's this uh, lion's mane mushroom. Yep. Well, to get the benefits of it, you're going to have to take quite a bit of it. And, and you know, people, at you know, there's companies out there that will sell you these products acting like, oh, yeah, t take two capsules a day of this and, and you're going to you're good to go. You're not good to go. You, you have to really take a significant amount. And and for me, the key for me is is um, I, I want to analyze my products. I want to say to my customers, I've analyzed my products. I've got 25 percent beta glucan in that product. I have zero starch. I'm giving you an opportunity to to um, know that you actually have the the compounds in this product that make it what it is medicinal so one one of the tricks to medicinal mushrooms that i think is, is unknown is that when you grow them on grains they don't get the precursors that are required to make the medicinal extract can you talk some more about why sort of feeding grain to mushrooms is just about as bad as feeding grains to cows like what comes out <laughs> the other end isn't the right thing oh uh, well yeah I, I mean it's a it's a very um you know let me start by saying this, that the, um, the reason why mycelium is being grown on grain is very simple. It's uh, you cannot produce mushrooms in North America uh, cheaply enough to sell them as a nutritional supplement. You cannot do that. It, you just, it's just, if you take, a, for example, if you take a, a um, pound of shiitake mushrooms and the grower uh, has to get um, I think last year it was three dollars and fifty cents a pound. Well, um, if you dry that out, that becomes thirty-five dollars a pound. Now the grower has to get thirty-five dollars a pound for that same pound of shiitake mushrooms. Nobody is going to pay him that amount of money for that. So, so, so because of that, in North America, um, producers are like, I can't grow mushrooms, but. I can grow mycelium on grain in a in a laboratory in a sterile environment, and and what this is, it's a very simple product that that has been around since the 1930s when it was a revolution, which was this is called mushroom spawn. This is actually the seed that is used to produce mushrooms. Normally, you would take this mycelium on grain and you would break it up and you would you would uh, spread it through a substrate, something that you were, uh, the mushroom was going to feed on to produce mushrooms. That's what this is. Um, so what some people have done, and, and here, here's the thing, I did the same thing in the 90s. I, in fact, and I've grown mushroom spawn for years and years and years. I know mushroom spawn. I even sold it as a supplement in the 90s, but, th but I realized that, uh, that you end up with all this residual grain in there and you don't have the, uh, to address your question, the active precursors that you need. For example, reishi mushroom. Reishi mushroom mycelium on grain produces none of the important triterpenes. These triterpenes are why reishi mushroom is unique. <laughs> They're very important compounds and, and mycelium on grain, we've tested mycelium on grain. It is a flat line. There are no peaks in our high performance liquid chromatography test. This is, There's th nothing there. It's the same with chaga. People out there are buying these chaga products and well the the place where chaga gets the betulin and the trimetallic acid and these other important compounds is the tree. Without the tree and the precursors in the tree it's not in this chaga. So what this means is that most cultivated mushrooms, because they're cultivated in a cheap industrial manner, even if they're medicinal, don't have medicinal compounds. You have to get them wildcrafted or the cultivator has to go out and find the substrate, like ground up trees maybe and put those in a, in a warehouse somewhere. <laughs> well, uh, shipping trees actually, is kind of expensive, but. Well, well yes and no. What, what, it, what it does mean is, is that no, there are lots of mushrooms in this world. Lots of mushrooms. 85% <laughs> of those mushrooms are grown in China. That's where I get my mushrooms, Dave. 
I get my mushrooms from China. I traveled in China all through the 90s. I, I visited farms, I visited research facilities, I visited factories that produced it, extracts. In 1997, I went to China and I sponsored the very first organic mushroom certification symposium in China. Literally, that was the first, 1997. And um, around 2000, 2001, people were producing the very first organically certified mushrooms in China. When you went to China, though, we're talking about organic in China in the mid 90s. Like even now, organic in China is generally something that Chinese people don't believe. Like they'll not buy Chinese made organic products <laughs> because they know it's a lie. Uh, well, maybe it's not, but it generally can be. So, well, <laughs> like, yeah, you know what? It's, a, it's an interesting subject because, you know, I, I guess what I would say is certainly um, Chinese certifiers you might be suspect of the, the products that, that I get from China that are organically certified are actually certified by, by European certifiers, high quality, well-known European certifier. And, and let me say too that, you know, it's a concern. It's a concern everywhere, but, but let's face it. Um, do you eat all organic produce and fruit? And do people in the U S do that? I mean, I do, I, I do my best to, but, we spread, spread tons of pesticides and chemicals around as well. But, but I'm sensitive to this, of course. And, and every product that, we, that comes over has to go through very significant testing. Heavy metals, especially. I mean, everybody's looking at heavy metals. I've always had to test my products for heavy metals. Especially Microorganisms, from China. pesticides. We, we have to test all these products. So, so I can't sell these products unless they've been tested. So here's a weird question about microbiological testing. I bought a couple pounds of shiitake mushrooms at Costco years ago, and yep. they were actually covered in mold. <laughs> what the heck was going on there? Okay, here, here, here's what's going on. <laughs> um, there's two things going on, Dave. One of which is, is it's taken a long time for produce managers to understand how to handle mushrooms, yeah. fresh mushrooms. And, and number two, which is very interesting, is if you leave them out too long, uh, and especially if you have them, because I've seen this on oyster mushrooms before, if you have them overwrapped, as they get older, what happens is the mycelium starts to grow because the, the mushroom itself is made up of similar tissue as mycelium. So all of a sudden that mushroom will start to regrow its mycelial part. I've even seen mushrooms growing off of mushrooms. And I've seen that in, I've seen that in, uh, in, <laughs> in supermarkets before. And, and I, I want to say to the produce manager, has nobody trained you here? You've got mushrooms there that, that absolutely should not be sold. They belong in the garbage. So that's kind of what happened with you. I'm sure the Costco person was not sensitive to that and shouldn't have been selling those. And, so and that happens a lot. Was it the shiitake mushrooms. basically growing shiitake in itself? It looked like a different species. Like it was. Well, I think what was going on is, is you see, it was probably a whitish mold. Yep. And that is just the shiitake. Um, it's, it's still alive, basically. Mm -hmm. And so because it's in a high humidity high carbon dioxide environment which it could have been or maybe it's just sitting in this box and it's a, and it's kind of warmer it will just start to regenerate the mycelial stage and when that starts happening are they safe to eat they just look ugly well you know what they are safe to eat but but you have to be careful at that stage i wouldn't eat them and and part, part of what happens is is with mushrooms is as they reach a certain point thing more than anything else you have to look look out for is just the bacteria got it and, and you'll see that on on uh, like let's like say white button mushrooms they'll start to get brown spots on them shiitake mushrooms you look at the gills and they'll start to get brown kinda, spots kinda and that's slimy. bacterial growth okay and what kind of bacteria is strong enough to grow on a fungus it seems like fun fungi and bacteria have been fighting since time immemorial <laughs> with little chemical weapons at each other 
Uh, what, what happens well, to yeah. the mushroom and what happens to the bacteria when there's some competition going on on the mushroom? Oh, well, you know what? The mushroom is able to, um, I mean, I, I look at it almost as a, a cooperative dance where, you know, for example, like mushrooms in nature. What happens with mushrooms in nature? The mycelium is out there and is spreading through all of that material in nature, uh, consuming it. And, and it's, it's in competition with all sorts of microorganisms out there. There's got bacteria, they've got other fungi, imperfect fungi, fungi that don't produce mushrooms. It's competing and, and everybody's vying for these nutrients. And a lot of times what happens is, is with these nutrients is, is they, uh, the mushroom consumes something. When it's done, somebody else comes in and starts to consume it even more. So there's a constant process of, of um, decomposition going on. And that, that's kind of, in a way, the beauty of, of what's going on in our environment is that everything is in a constant state of, of breakdown, so to speak. But it's, it's a breakdown that is regeneration. And, and that's a, a, just a, an absolute constant out there. And, and I, I love it when I go out mushroom hunting and, and seeing all of this uh, going on around me. I, people have actually called me like anti-mushroom because I, I'm like, be cautious of eating these things because you don't know what they're going to do to you. <laughs> but I, I'm actually like a Paul Stamets fan. And I, I do, I understand we'd all be dead without fungus in our environment. It's, it's really important. But I, I also just filmed a documentary called Moldy. Uh, just quick plug, moldymovie.com if you haven't seen it. And I interviewed a whole bunch of people about common soil fungi growing in buildings and, uh, and to some extent in our food and what that's doing to people. And these aren't actually mushrooms. You know, these are molds. Yes, molds. That's right. But, that's right. You know, these are kind of the, the same family. And it, it, we all know that there are tons of, of so-called toadstools and poisonous mushrooms and things like that. Yep, yep, yep. Well, yeah, and, and you know what I, I would say is... is um, yeah, I understand and I totally agree. I mean, there are things out there. For example, there are fungi that grow into grain. And, oh, yeah. and uh, as you know, there are, there are aflatoxins out there. There are these toxins that you have to be uh, very uh, careful about. So, so this, is, this is definitely a concern, especially with our food. And uh, we don't want to be consuming those kind of things. And, and the other thing, too, is certainly... You don't want to be in an environment where there are a lot of spores being produced that you might breathe in. There's actually there's actually something out there called mushroom harvester's lung. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because and, and this is this is the beauty of the button mushroom. The button mushroom ha, is grown and harvested before it matures and the gills start to produce spores. So you don't have that in button mushroom farms. But if you're in an oyster mushroom farm. The fact is, is that you've got to have a respirator on because the oyster mushroom is an is an open mushroom almost right from the beginning. So the gills are there, and as it matures, it is producing a lot of spores. and And it's the same thing, um, like on a Ganoderma farm in China. It's really interesting because you go in, and as they are maturing, and this is a greenhouse. It is absolutely wall to wall, big, beautiful reishi mushrooms, but it is filled with this r brown cloud of spores. Wow. And, 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 and you're looking in there going, my God, okay, these mushrooms are producing a lot. And, and the interesting part about it is, is that that was what was going on in the 90s. But today, they are actually harvesting the reishi spores. And the reishi spores have now become a very big medicinal product in China. And when I was just there last year, the harvesting methods, they no longer allow the spores to, to um, come out and up into the air within the house. Now they actually put a uh, paper around the mushroom at a certain stage. They, they have a plastic bag under it. And the spores fall down into this plastic bag. Wow. And, and so when they go to harvest the mushroom, they have a bag. And, and at this point in time, the spores are actually more valuable than the mushroom. So, so I, I've heard about like fractured spore mushroom extracts coming from China, but I haven't even tried one. 
Because we actually don't digest spores well at all. No, that's right. That's absolutely right. Spores, spores, generally speaking, will go right through us. We cannot digest spores. And however, they believe that if they can, they call them cracked spores, if they can crack that shell, that then they can get at the compounds inside, which they consider to be highly medicinal. Are they? I, I've looked at some of the research. I'm uncertain at this point and we're we're exploring this we're we're looking at ways that we can actually um, analyze these spores find out what's in there uh, there's claims that they're high in triterpenes there's claims that they're beta glucans in there I don't really know for certain I've kind of just stayed away because you know what happens so often Dave is that is that there are products that go to market that get hyped up so much that trying to figure out what is real and what is just marketing hype becomes difficult. And uh, reishi spores are one of those products where you get marketers out there and, and they're selling these things left, right, and center for a lot of money in China, making a lot of money on it. And so I just step back and go, okay, I've got to wait and look at the research a little more closely. I've got to do some analysis on my own. Um, we're doing that. We'll, we'll see down the line whether or not it's real or not. Okay, that, uh, that's a nice cautious tone, and I tend to have that as well, where like, you'd want to see some research about it, and I haven't seen much there. I've just heard that it's popular, which is maybe a bad thing. <laughs> well, no, yeah, it, it's... And, and you know what? I, I'm, I'm one of those people that truly believes in, in scientific verification of uh, active compounds. And, and so this is one of the things in the whole mushroom industry that's been lacking all along is, is there have not been enough tests to be able to actually get a, um, let's just call it a fingerprint, a, mm -hmm. a actual um, activity fingerprint and that's what I've done in my white paper was produce an activity fingerprint one of the other tests we did was for a compound called ergosterol ergosterol is a really interesting compound I don't you I don't know if you've heard about it but ergosterol mm -hmm. is is a corollary to cholesterol that we have except in fungi it's called ergosterol ergosterol when you expose mushroom tissue to UV light ergosterol turns into vitamin D yep which is is just amazing. I mean, it's just a, it's just a wonderful thing. Um, you're not going to get a lot of vitamin D just by eating mushrooms as they are, because most mushrooms are either grown indoors or once they're harvested, <clears throat> they um, go right into a cooler and then off they go to the supermarket. Um, you can take those dried shiitake, put them out in the sunlight, and that will convert some of the ergosterol to vitamin D. I've even seen supplements that now are based on mushroom tissue, vitamin vitamin D2 supplements that are based on mushroom tissue. And, and I, I just think that is fantastic. One of, one of the things though, one, let me just tell you a little story about that. The, the Chinese traditionally have taken their shiitake mushrooms and when they harvest them, they lay them out on screens and they dry them in the sun sun-dried yep. they, they've got these sun-dried shiitake and so here's something they've been doing for the longest time drying them in the sun which is producing a high vitamin d shiitake in the last 10 years since they've gotten um, more industrialized what do they do with the shiitake now they put it into a indoor mechanical dryer forced air dryer they're doing just exactly the opposite of what they should be doing with those shiitake. But this is sort of like, well, here we are. We're in an industry. We want to be more industrialized. We want to be have all this great equipment here, new equipment. This is how they do it in the West. They're changing to that. And I'm just looking at it going, this is a huge mistake. So sometimes the traditional methods are, are better. And uh, I know that uh, animal source vitamin D3 is pretty easy to get, and vitamin D2 is just less biologically active and potentially harmful. And there's one company who was making vitamin D3, I think from shiitake, uh, concentrate of some sort, but it's it's frightfully expensive. But 
If, uh, yeah, I I haven't heard of that. And what what I, I I would be surprised if they were making D three because D three is is um, I've never heard of that actually coming from a mushroom at all. I've I've just seen it coming from um, uh, from uh, D two coming from a mushroom. So I don't know D two. You know I I've looked at it a bit and and I'm not sure of the research you've looked at. But what I've seen of D two is is most of the tests show that it's it's active. I'm not sure whether they know that some some studies say it's just as active as D3. Other studies say no. So whether or not, um, you know, I, I'd have to see. In, in fact, I'd love to see some of the some of the uh, research that you're looking at that talks about D2 and, and any sort of uh, negative. Uh, it, it comes from the Vitamin D Research Council and Dr. Cannell's work. And Dr. Cannell's uh, spoken a couple times at the anti-aging nonprofit that I run and okay. has spent like 30 something years as really a primary vitamin D researcher. So he has a bias towards vitamin D, but he's done some some writing about- By vitamin D, you mean vitamin D3 well, from other sources? D, well, he's been looking at D2 and D3 and just looking yeah. at the rate of, I believe from memory, like hip fracture from D2 versus D3 and a few other things oh, like okay. that that said okay. vitamin D2 okay. was maybe displacing D3. Um, interesting. Which is uh, which is interesting, and I, I was just looking here because now I'm 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 wondering about the D3, and it looks like there is a company um, called Source of Life that claims to have a vitamin D3 from mushroom, but there's some questions about that. I yeah okay. I, I would be very questionable. I would say it's a very questionable product. I, I've never heard of that. I don't think it's possible. It is a completely different compound. You know, it's a cola calciferol versus ergo calciferol. A different different. Uh, compounds. Got it. So I'm looking at, at some stuff here. The company has never responded, at least according to one of the other websites about it. So it sounds like it might have been V2, D2, but they were claiming D3, and I, I stand corrected in that uh, usually D3, it turns out lichen can make D3, but not mushrooms. So I didn't know that oh. either. I'm just Googling as, oh, we, okay. as we talk. So. <laughs> Okay. The trivial things we learn while talking. Uh, oh, experts. oh, I know. I, I mean, and that, that's the wonder, wonderful thing about uh, uh, talking to people about various subjects, you know. And, and uh, you know, you know I, I've, I've been kind of, um, you, you know, in the last couple of years, I really dove back into the research a lot. And there's, there's so much information out there. You know that. You've been in it and you see it in whatever particular field. And it's so hard to keep up on. And, and yet... It's, it's important and, and most of us, you know, we can be broad in a certain sense in what we know and, and at the same time we kind of specialize to some degree. That's true. And you're a, a very deep specialist in this and I want to make sure that the people listening get some real actionable things out of this. Can you walk me through the medicinal value of, of what's in mushrooms? Like I want to talk specifically so people understand. What about beta-glucans and cell walls? I'll just kind of go through the list of things in mushrooms. Tell me what they do or why we should care about them. So, Well, there's been a lot of study on beta-glucans over the last 40 or 50 years. And really, they have shown now, after all this time, that beta-glucans actually will activate our immune cells. And... and uh, beta glu there, there's a lot of different beta glucans yeah. out there. The ones specifically that are in mushrooms are called beta one three one six glucans, and that is just the the configuration of the beta glucan, and that's very important because other beta glucans yeah. out there are not active in the same way. Like there are beta glucans in oats, in cereal grains, but there those are beta one four glucans. They don't have the same uh, uh, immunological activity that these beta glucans from mushrooms do and and it has a lot to do with the branching of it just like different mushrooms have different levels of activities uh, but this beta glucan makes up the cell walls of mushrooms it is it is the major component in the cell wall of the mushroom so so that's a that's something that ultimately we want to break down with our extracts and get it into a form that actually people can um, can get benefits from because because one of the things about mushrooms is that they do have this this substance called chitin in their cell walls and you may have heard about chitin I was actually going to ask you about chitin next so yeah, it's awesome and, and tell, and tell me about it yeah chitin's really an interesting thing you know it, it's uh, um, 
it's a polymer that it, it's it's elastic but it's a super strength in a way it's almost like the kevlar of the natural world it's a super strength kind of polymer and it's present in mushroom cell walls and it's part of what it's a structural component it's what helps mushrooms to a degree stand up a lot of people um, have said um, without I think good reason that that oh mushrooms are indigestible because of this chitin that's simply not true mushrooms are not as digestible as many other vegetables because of chitin but all that chitin does is is make them a little less digestible but to a degree that's not a bad thing because one of the benefits of mushrooms is it's very high in fiber and a lot of that fiber is the chitin that's moving through the system and some of the other cell wall components and that ends up being a prebiotic so mushrooms are actually a very good prebiotic so so the chitin actually makes up somewhere around 5% of the cell wall, whereas the, the, the beta-glucan component is upwards of 60% of the cell wall. So the chitin's a, a, a small percentage, but it is there. Um, people, you also might think of chitin as something that helps to make up an insect or even a, a crustacean shell. But the, the difference is, is that that chitin binds with calcium carbonate in, in the and the, with a crustacean so most of that crustacean shell I mean a mushroom doesn't have a a hard carapace or a hard shell like that crustacean does so so you can't say oh gee they're both made up of a chitin so they're the same not at all uh, so chitin is one of those compounds that we have to think about but it's not something where you go oh, you can't digest mushrooms that's simply not true okay that makes good sense what about, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, triterpenoids, but uh, tell me what triterpenoids is secondary metabolites do. Like, why would people want to take those? What are the, the benefits? Well, you know, triterpenes have been, have been found to have a lot of different actions. And um, one of them is uh, certainly they, they have shown um, immunological anti-cancer actions. Um, they're also used for... Uh, liver. In fact, I, I spoke to a traditional Chinese uh, uh, doctor in China. He said uh, Ganoderma, he said Reishi was his number one liver um, herb. So it's good for um, cleansing the liver. Um, it's antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral. It's got a number of different actions. Um, so and that's really what makes reishi so unique. Reishi has these triterpenes. Triterpenes are something that, that was one of the first analytical methods that my company developed in the 1990s was for triterpenes. We've been measuring triterpenes in reishi mushrooms since 1994. We did it in the lab at University of British Columbia with a, a, a professor emeritus there, Dr. Neil Towers. Um, but if there was any one mushroom that people should think about, I would say it's reishi mushroom because it's very high in beta-glucan, so you're getting the immunological action of the beta-glucans, and you're also getting these other actions um, of the triterpenes. And, and uh, so it's kind of like the, the well, <laughs> I hate to say king of mushrooms here because I've heard so many uh, people talk about this, and, and the funny part of that is that in the, in the 1970s, a book was written about shiitake that came out of Japan, and it was called Shiitake, King of Mushrooms. And then in the 1980s uh, and early 90s, reishi was the king of mushrooms. And then in the 1990s, a company came along with maitake, and, and maitake became the king of mushrooms. And now I'm out there, and people are saying, the new king of mushrooms is chaga. And I'm like, <laughs> and, and, you know, somebody even said, Chaga is the king of mushrooms and Reishi is the queen. <laughs> if you look at the history of Chinese emperors, uh, there's been more than one uh, different <laughs> dynasty, so we just have mushroom dynasties, and I guess we're all right on that. Well, well and I, I just find it amusing because I think a lot of people just haven't been around enough to have uh, experienced all these different king of mushrooms. I have. <laughs> so, so now if, if someone were to, to come to you and say, like, I want to take one mushroom that's going to do the most for me, 
and uh, what which one and how should I take it? What would you say? Well, again, again, I would say um, reishi mushroom. And I would say and how would for how would you have them take it? I, w- I would look for um, an extract. I would look for and, and and to be clear, making sure that what we're looking for is an actual mushroom that has been extracted, and and if possible, something that has been measured for triterpenes, something that has been measured for beta glucans, very important. Um, if you can't find that somewhere, maybe you can find actually, you know, if you're on the West Coast, you can probably find reishi mushrooms themselves and, and be able to make them up. But otherwise, if you're looking for a bottle product, that's what I'd look for. I would stay away. I would look very closely at these mycelium products. Look at the labels. Look very closely. Beware of what you're buying. If you want to buy these mycelium products, fine, but be aware that that's not a mushroom. Be aware that it's got grain in there. So I would say reishi. The other thing I would say is, is I think there's a place for putting, um, let's say, three mushrooms together in a formula, like like reishi, shiitake, maitake. I, I think that's there's there's good uh, um, reason to do that. The other mushroom that's really great out there is tremedes, turkey tail. But again, make sure you're getting the mushroom. Make sure you're getting an extract of that mushroom. If you're if you're not you're probably not getting enough of the medicinal compounds to do you any good. And, and, and the other thing is, don't expect effects immediately. Don't expect those benefits to come tomorrow. Don't, don't think that tomorrow your, your sore throat and your cold is going to be gone. It's not. You have to take these regularly for a period of time. And the beauty of these is that these are what are considered adaptogens. These are actually um, herbs and compounds that are taken over a long period of time. You don't have to worry about, oh, I've got to stop taking them or anything. You can take them for a long period of time and, and they, will give, they will actually provide you with these benefits that are, are um, anti-stress. They, they um, balance the different systems of the body. Mushrooms are fantastic in that way. And, and, and again, the beauty of mushrooms is that they're one of the one of what I would call the first nutraceuticals. They are food as medicine. They are both. Um, so they're some of the first. You've got shiitake mushrooms that were have been been used in China for thousands of years. Um, food medicine, maitake, same thing. It's it's a it's really a great food that can also become your medicine. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, for coming on the show and just going deep on mushrooms and uh, helping people understand when you're buying a mycelium product, you're actually not getting real mushrooms, which is, uh, which is a problem. And uh, we're not recommending one brand over another. You're a, a mushroom ingredient supplier. You're, you're, far, That's right. you're far up the chain. So this isn't like I am. You, you or anyone trying to say this is better than another, but just saying that there's widespread, well, it's not technically mislabeling because some of them actually say mycelium, but you think you're getting something that's active and you're probably spending 30 or 40 bucks, uh, or it may not even say mycelium, it may just say the name of the mushroom, but you think you're getting it and you're not. Uh, so That's absolutely I, right. I've found that, that mushroom extracts can be really, really effective, and some of the Chinese medicine people I've worked with, acupuncturists, use them to great effect. I've also taken a lot of formulas that don't do anything, so uh, I think there's, you've written the white paper, this 30-page piece of research that shows why you went out and you, you looked at actually what's in 40 different things, and I appreciate that you did that at your own expense, and then you, you published it. And yeah, you had a little economic incentive because you make the good stuff, but still, you know, putting numbers out there is, is something that I uh, that I really value. So thanks for doing that. Thank you. Yeah, and and uh, I appreciate you having me on the show. I mean, you know, we could probably go on for a long time. Oh. <laughs> there's there's a lot of material to cover, and and uh, I'm really happy that you were able to have me, Dave, because. Uh, it's uh, it's something where again there there's a lot to know. There's not a lot of information out there. There's a lot of information that is just erroneous. And so uh, I want people to understand what's going on here. I want them to understand what is a good mushroom product. How to be an educated consumer. That, that's really what it's all about. How to be and and it's not easy. Believe me, it's not easy when you're looking at the shelf and you're seeing a dozen different products. Well, you, you live uh, on Vancouver Island, same place I do. You're up in Tofino, which is one of the most scenic parts of the world. But if you ever make it to the southern part of the island, we'll sit down and over a cup of Bulletproof coffee at Bulletproof Labs here 
and uh, have a further chat about mushrooms because it's always it's always interesting to talk with people who spent their life studying something like that. So, so thank, <laughs> thanks for living on the island. That's great. And thanks for being on Bulletproof Radio. Thank you very much, Dave. If you appreciated today's show, all you got to do is go out there and find some quality mushroom extract and quit buying the cheap stuff because it doesn't work. Have an awesome day. Check out the next episode of Bulletproof Radio because we've got something really special coming up for you. I'm not going to tell you what it is. And if you haven't had a chance to check out bulletproofconference.com, go for it because October 23rd through October 25th in Pasadena, California, we're going to have almost or about a thousand people showing up to the Bulletproof Conference to hack themselves, to play with big toys, and to hear from some of the world leading scientists about how you can improve your cognitive, personal, and physical performance. It's going to be fun and you can hang out with cool people anyway. So join me there. I'm excited about it. Have an awesome day.